But today I want to focus a little bit on this whole topic of unconventional oil and gas. Is it a mountain or is it a molehill? You can certainly, if you're in broad public, hear all aspects of this uh, conversation. We'll do it in three parts. Energy and carbon, just give some context for that. Um, come back and look at the unconventional oil and gas reserves. And then is it a mountain or a molehill? Let's start with this figure. I love this figure from Berkeley. Uh, we'll build it in case you haven't seen it. We use energy in four ways. You know, we move ourselves around and we heat and cool things. Buildings, industrial, residential, commercial buildings. Electricity is feeding that sector now, growing as an end use energy. It's not a primary energy, but as an end use across the world. And it feeds all those sectors. Not so much in autos yet, in cars and vehicles, but starting to. And then in comes the all oh, slides of color coded. The green's always going to be oil, red gas, and coal is red. Petroleum, these numbers are in quads. You probably can't see them if you're up in the back. Fortunately for the physics in the room, a quad is about the same energy as an exajoule, if that helps you. And, and for the oil and gas people, that's about one TC out of the gas. You can read these in anything, any way you want to think. Um, but the width of the bar is proportional to the number. Oil is transportation. It's used other places, heating and making some power in certain places. But largely transportation depends on oil. Biomass, coal is still king. These are US numbers, but it feeds power generation. Natural gas is the most versatile fuel. It's in all sectors, a little bit in transportation, starting to grow, even LNG, uh, long haul trucks, certainly CNG. Uh, here comes geothermal. Again, the wind matters. Uh, wind, hydro, nuclear. I'm from Texas. For eight years, I had to say nuclear. But uh, <laughs> now I say nuclear, president. So I'm bilingual. Um, <laughs> and finally, solar. OK, that's it. That's all the fuels that feed into this. And if you take these and look at what comes out of the back end, it's about, in the US, if 100 quads are coming in, it's, it's not even 50 that come out as work, useful work that gets done. That means we waste, we're not gonna dwell on that today in terms of time, but we waste over half of the energy that comes in is heat, now the stacks and tailpipes, mostly. Well, let's focus on electricity generation. Here it is through time, 04 to 13, and again, Lord Oxford did a really nice job of this. The data I'm showing you behind this in 2008, when coal was more than 2x natural gas in power grid. And if you come to 2011 and look at the forecast for 12, they were forecasting 3630. Well, in fact, in April of this year in the US, coal and natural gas and power were the same. Mm. Now, it won't stay that way with summer, you know, heating and that kind of thing, but a tremendous amount of coal and the power sector is being replaced by natural gas in just a few years. A remarkable acceleration that not many people were predicting. As a result of that, in 2012, the U.S. will produce nearly a gigaton less CO2 than it has in the past. It's fallen dramatically, faster than any other country in the world, including those with carbon taxes and cap and trade. That's driven by markets and natural gas, mostly shale gas, and driving that price down and then creating that affordable fuel for power generation. So a remarkable story here. Back to 1992 levels. North America on the left, again, same color schemes. You see gas forecasted to go up at the expense of coal. Same with Europe, same scale. Here's Asia, same color scheme. Today, Asia Pacific is about the same as Europe and North America combined. It's forecast to be close to 2x by 2030. And you can see the gray. There's a lot of coal. Nuclear power plants are being built in China. I understand 26 are being built today. LNG terminals, etc. But a tremendous amount of coal. Cretaceous coals in India. Okay? So this is one of the great challenges in a carbon-constrained world. Let's go back now and focus on oil and gas then. Where is it coming from? What unconventionals? This figure shows that the left of this white line is the amount of natural gas that we have consumed in the world today. To the right are estimates of the resources, not reserves, just estimates of resources that still remain. It's a tremendous number. And we're going to focus in on these tight gas, shell gas, and full bed methane, the so-called unconventionals. Here is the US natural gas production. It peaked in the 70s. You heard a lot about peat gas, it's kind of flattened, now it's gone up. You don't hear much about peat gas anymore, at least in the U.S. It exceeds today where it was in the 70s. And the reserves have tracked right along with that. So you've got, in terms of mountain and molehill, 
Let's just start with some geologic terms. Maybe this is Twin Peaks. Okay. Either a mountain or a molehill. Let's zoom in on that, that window from 1920 to 2010. Here's conventional, non-associated onshore, associated with oil. There's Alaska, non-associated offshore. So indeed, these forms of natural gas did peak and have been coming down pretty steadily. If you put in there tight gas, coal bed methane or coal bed natural gas, and the latest player, shale gas, in fact, you're producing 60%, close to 60% today of natural gas in the U.S. from non-conventional sources. So that looks more like an undulating mesa to me, uh, <laughs> not a peak, not a mountain or a mole. Let's keep going. What is this shale stuff? This is a technique that the Bureau of Economics first published on and pioneered argon ion milling to get into a shale and look just at those pore systems that exist. So we take a very high magnification look at that face, and here you can see it. Look at the scale bar, 500 nanometers here in the lower right. See that polished face? It allows us to go from the polished thin section on the left, same scale, to the one on the right, which is actually seeing the constituents in shale. And so doing that, you can begin to see the pore system. These are pores from the Barnett shale in organic material. The orange circles are 20 nanometers, so this is very small. In fact, if I take the hypothetical or schematic molecule of methane in a pore throat and shrink that to the same size, watch closely, it doesn't quite go away. We're down to molecular scale pore throats in some cases. Put a human hair up here, it's not one. I just told it to look like one. It's the right one. All right. 50 microns. I'm going to shrink the pore system onto the human hair now to the same scale. There you have it. That's your pore system in shale gas. I tell students, welcome to your world. This is your future. You're going to have to need to understand this, and it's very exciting. So there's a lot of shale. North America has a tremendous amount of shale. Big basins currently being developed, and some in more that are prospective. The U.S. isn't the only place with shale. You're going to hear about it all week. We have a session uh, tomorrow afternoon on shale gas uh, that I, if you're interested, I encourage you to attend. Lots of shale in the world. The mother load, if you will, the kitchen where all these hydrocarbons have come from. This is an animation from our work in the Barnett. In the lower left, you're going to see the years clicking off, 1985, 86. The triangles are vertical wells that were drilled each year. The color scheme, blue is low production, normalized, the first 24 months normalized. And as they get hotter and hotter colors, you're going to start to see higher and higher production. And you're going to see the switch here as we start to come up into the 2000s from dominantly vertical wells to the horizontal wells that were drilled. This at the time in 1998-99 was called the core area. It's thought to be the only place the Barnett would produce for several reasons. You know, welcome technology, welcome economics, welcome other drivers. First circles are starting to appear in 2004. See how the circles get bigger and brighter? Drilling, 2007, 8, Nine. The scale bar in the middle is 50 miles. It's about 100 and something miles by 60 or 70 mile area. That's 16,000 wells drilled in the Barnett today. And we've looked at every single one of them and done a pretty neat study we'll report on tomorrow. I'll show you some results that's from it in a second. The challenge, of course, with that is that's a heck of a lot of wells. That's a lot of environmental disruption on the surface, including not just what you have to look at, water and province and other things. This is a well in that play that's just south of our sister's uh, university, UT Arlington. And you can see the university. If I look at the map view, then the, the green oval is where that well is located. And there's the university. The university said, now you're not going to drill here. And the company said, yeah, I think we are. <laughs> so those are the horizontal well paths that came off of one platform. Now, they don't really like you showing that because it's expensive. It costs more to go down and turn and turn again. But it can be done. We can reduce the environmental footprint at a cost. So what are some of the challenges? We've got to determine whether these low-quality reservoirs uh, can be developed economically. Continuous reservoirs, if you will. Where are the sweet spots? It's not just one big blob. These things vary by geology, as we all expect they would in this room. Advanced technologies for fracking and other primary stimulation approaches. Heavy duty use of fluids right now. Can we reduce that? Can we reduce the chemicals? Can we go to dry? A lot of that's being worked on. So what are the recovery strategies beyond primary, secondary, tertiary? Do they make money or not? What are the estimated recoveries, realistic ones? And forecast, production forecasts. 
environmental effects. How can we address these effects to produce these low quality reserves? And that leads to some implications. Traffic, noise, and light, water, land use. Again, low rocks grow out mine some of these very well. Natural occurring radioactive material, methane, earthquakes. And by definition, a hydraulic fracture causes a microquake where it's cracking. Um, turns out it's not related to the big, bigger ones, three to four. That's more related to water injection on occasion. But a lot of the things that go on here are not significant in terms of disrupting the environment, but people are concerned about them. You've got to play that off against energy security. Is it available? Natural gas, affordable, reliable? And is it clean or cleaner? It meets all these criteria. Okay? So in an energy security sense, that's very important. You've got to balance that against the options, nuclear and coal. That's one of the great challenges moving forward. So it reminds me of this picture. This is the, the federal government's gotten very involved in this. And, and so this just, I look at that and say, we're the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and we're here to help you. Okay. <laughs> this is actually the winner of the last photo taken contest. Um, <laughs> the runner-up was this, this fella in the last photo taken contest. <laughs> uh -huh. oh, look at that. That's what the talking. former picture was the EPA, this is industry. Hey, look what we got. Hydrofracking. You know? So industry and government and academics need to get together and solve these issues as we move forward. And they can. And make sure the public understands what some of the real issues are and what the real data. Look at an oil, same plot. Resources against production to the left of the white line is what's been produced today. 1.3 trillion barrels. Again, you hear about peak oil, you hear about it often when the price spikes, and you'll even hear people say it's peaked already. A lot of resources left at the right price and the right technology. Heavy oil and oil shale and shale oils are part of that resource. If you believe this, there's a lot. Trillions of barrels. Let's take a look in Canada. We went up here in the film and went to the oil sands. Here they're basically converting methane to liquids. They're using methane and oil water make steam, and they transport that steam to these parallel well bores, it's called SAG heat, steam assisted gravity drainage. They heat the oil, which is about the density of a hockey puck. It has to be a hockey puck, it's Canada. So, and they get it to start to flow. And it flows down pipelines, kind of as a sludge, into the system where they add more methane and heat and take it away for refining. About 20% of the Athabasca oil sands are surface mining, pretty ugly, although being reclaimed, 80% is like this. Replant it, you hardly know the path is there when they replant the trees 20 years later. How about the shale oil? This is the Bakken. North Dakota is now approaching the second largest producing state in the United States. Competing with Alaska. Okay? Who would have thought that just a decade ago? Hydrofracking, 10,000 foot laterals with 40 stage hydraulic fractures. 10,000 feet, two miles, three kilometers long. Remarkable technology coming through a Christmas tree and they move it away in tank patterns. So this is a company that I've done some work with. This is their rate against cumulative oil. You can see the decline. This is when they were fracking the whole interval as one. And then you start to increase the frack stages and make them shorter in between the lengths. So production against cumulative, you start to see higher production, greater cumulus. That's not perfect. There's colors that underlie the other colors. But as you lay these out, you get down to 250 foot spacing there. It's a tremendous amount of resource driven by technology. The other thing that technology allows is for drilling. This is down in the Eagle Fork Shale in Texas. And they originally planned here for about 100 acre spacing, 250 wells. That's pretty dense drilling. And then they did a little study that looked at even denser drilling, and now I think they might be able to go to 55 acre spacing, 340 wells in that area. It's like mining but with well bores in the subsurface. So in, increased uh, drilling density. I'll wrap it up here with a mountain or a mole, back to the Barnett. The base case study of our work, and again, we'll go through this in detail tomorrow, shows about two TCF per year, about 10% of the US production, for a little while, still out in the future, several years out in the future, and then slowly declining. That's about 59 TCF of estimated ultimate recovery from 444 TCF in place, free gas in place, okay? The Barnett today has produced 10. So that's a substantial amount of future production. The Barnett, which is thought to be one of the old 
plays in these shales. The very conservative $2 and MCF gas for an MMBTU gas forever, after 2030, $2 gets you 30 TCF, and $6 gets you 65. And you don't get a lot of price help after that. Big resources. That to me looks a little bit more like a fault one now. Okay. And here's the bill. Antrim Shale, Barnett and Blue, Fayetteville, Woodford, Haynesville, these are the big plays in the U.S. This is not forecast, this is what's happened. That's the natural gas production bill from shale gas in the United States. Mm. About 5 TCF a gas today, about a quarter. Let's look at oil. Oil consumption in the U.S. peaked in the 70s and plateaued and dropped in the latest recession. Here's China, same scale. You can pick up the U.S. 1900s and set it on China today. Same curve that started to build. The difference is 100 million people versus 1.4 billion. Okay, a much bigger challenge as we move forward. Where does it go? It goes into cars. U.S. cars uh, are shown here back to 05. About 15 million a year added to the fleet. Here's China. A third of the U.S. seven years ago, 1.4 of the U.S. today. And not looking back. Smaller. A combustion engine for the most part. Some diesel, a few hybrids, mostly combustion engine gas. United States oil production peaked, it came down, and right at the very right hand side, you can see a little blip, doesn't look like much. Turns out that's about 500,000 barrels a day from what it would have been, and that's as a result of unconventional shale oils that are coming to bear in the U.S. today. So that looks like a cinder cone to me with it. And the side bit a little bit. Wrap it up. The result of that is net imports in the U.S. were 60% in 2005. They're below 50% today. Part of that is the economy. Part of that is the increase in production. And here's the bill then. This is a forecast. It's going from 2010 to 2022 for oil shales. And I'm showing the rate of it, the, the cost per barrel estimated for a 10% IRR. So it's more expensive, not unreasonable, 40 to 70 bucks, that range. And you build up towards three to four million barrels a day. The U.S. imports about a million barrels a day from Saudi Arabia, <coughs> plus or minus. So that gives you a feel for scale. It's a very substantial potential resource. What's the big picture here? Unconventional oil and gas can play a big role in the future energy mix. And shale resources are going to represent a vital part of that global oil mix, global oil and gas. The transition from coal to natural gas is going to reduce global carbon emissions greatly, agree completely, but the above ground challenges are real and thus operational practices, transparency, and publication are mandatory for us to be able to move forward and take advantage of these. Mountain or molehill, let's call it a shield volcano. <laughs> Thanks.